Recording, lovely. Good everybody. Uh, been recommended Greg by Thomas Nabs, two time guest, and, <laughs> and it was one of those things. I was like, oh shit, what have I, why haven't I got Greg on? Um, Greg, what did you do last weekend? I saw some dress ups. What was going on? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's been a pretty crazy um, last few weeks leading into Christmas, um, but also just sussing out like a whole bunch of work and then getting to the end of the week and just being absolutely smashed. So. Um, yeah, so sorry about that, um, right. but I'm on. I'm on this week. So good, good. And you got to you got to have balance in your life, especially in the silly season where things get things get a bit mad. That's Mate, it. That's it, we man. we ask everybody, and, and it's it's kind of a timestamp. It's um, who are, who is Greg Johnson today, mate? How would you define yourself? Whew. Um. I, I guess I like I functionally, uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Manta Five. Um, which is kind of a startup uh, in Hamilton that's developing a new pretty cool water sports product. Um, but yeah, really just try like pretty young uh, into the CEO role. So just really trying to grow my own strengths and really trying to grow the team and being stretched left, right and centered to be able to do that. Um, but then, yeah, just really trying. I mean, this year has been a lot about um, personal development for me as well. well. I kind of feel like I'm got to don't really have that sort of a healthier balance in terms of, you know, fitness and health and uh, all that, you know, getting out and doing my own things as well. So, yeah, I mean, towards the end of this year, I've really just been starting to try and do that and making time for myself in that. Um, and then, yeah, I'm just pretty passionate about helping other people with their ideas. So whether it be like sort of startup or social entrepreneurship or anything, um, just sort of sharing some of the things that I've learned in my role. So I find that pretty cool. So I've been involved in seed and stuff. Um, just applied to be on their board of trustees for next year. So that'd be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much me at this stage. Beautiful. And uh, you'll be a great board member. I, when I first came across you, Greg, you came, came um, with, you know, your, I guess, um, qualities preceded you and, and, and you came and gave up your time like many people do with, with seed, you know, it's all, all volunteer. And you talked to us about design thinking and, and questioning your assumptions and how I've talked about it with Gemma as well. How, how seed started is I had the assumption that moving to Hamilton it's bloody hard work and to meet anybody and everyone's in a click and, and um, maybe we should get something that brings like-minded people together and, and I was like, well, maybe that's just me. And, and you came in with an idea of how, how we test it. Why, why is it important to test the assumption to move forward? <laughs> yeah, uh, validation and assumptions are like my key buzzwords. I think yeah. people here get pretty sick of it. But <laughs> no, it's literally just, uh, it's, it's kind of my jam because it's just like, um, you know, it, a lot of people have really cool ideas and they, they want to sort of execute on their idea, but they don't really know how to go forward with it. And so I always just say like, okay, well, if you imagine your idea as being like really successful, you know, I'm going to sell this or give this service to these people and they're really going to enjoy it for these reasons. And, you know, I, I can make money this way or, you know, it can be funded this way. Um, I, I, I get them to imagine that being successful and then say, okay, what assumptions are you making about that big picture? And then how can you go about validating those things? Uh, and really, it comes down to um, letting go of your own ego, letting go of your own ideas, and actually going out and talking to the people that you're actually wanting to help um, or offer a service to and actually getting it from them. Because it just you, there's nuggets of gold that you learn from. Hey, Alex. <laughs> uh, there's nuggets of gold that you, you hear from, um, from those people, and you can get really good insights. And so it's not, it's not necessarily about asking them exactly what they want as such. I mean, you, you, everyone says, oh, you know, but um, Steve Jobs from Apple didn't sit there and wait for people to tell him that they wanted an iPhone or a, an iPod or whatever. He came up with it. But he had a, a super interesting insight into what customers actually were like and who he was targeting and, um, and what was important to them. And so that's kind of, that's my jam, really. And for Manta 5, we've got obviously a product that, it doesn't really address a need as such. I mean, you're not going to commute to work on it, but um, it, there's a whole bunch of assumptions that we're making about who the customer is, why they would want to purchase it, what they will use it for, um, what marketing strategies will work, um, you know, what business strategies are going to be effective, how to raise money, 
who we should be raising money from. They're all assumptions. And so I just try and get experts around me and try and go about um, talking to a whole bunch of people to try and get that validation. So we're, we're sort of narrowing in on a plan that we know we're more confident about. I just try, try and help other people to do the same. So Absolutely. And the feedback you get often drives your direction, which is, which is awesome. And uh, I saw, saw guys TED, TEDx talk where I could have, um, which is the beauty, yeah. of, the beauty of technology. Um, and you know, he, he just had a burning passion and created this thing. And then he sort of said that he hadn't really clicked why it was taking off so much until someone said, you've invented a new water sport. Um, and I guess there, yeah, that's there, there again is an example of the feedback all of a sudden drives what, what you might do at, going forward. Um, that's it. How, how has that sort of shaped the thinking at Mander 5? Yeah, it's been pretty fascinating. Eh? So Guy is obviously the founder of Torpedo 7, super passionate about road cycling and um, obviously sold a lot of water sports products through the platform. And so they built it over 12 years. And then as the as it was kind of coming to an end and they were they're looking to sell it to the warehouse group, it kind of allowed Guy to get back to what he loves doing, which is being a bit of a dreamer. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, he kind of saw um, the experience that, jet skis gave on water similar to a motorbike on land and and saw you know how a boat gave the experience of of a, of a car on water and then he was like well what actually replicates that whole feeling of cycling on water and he kind of looked at you know pontoon bikes and all this stuff and he said that doesn't really replicate that feeling um and so him being a bit of a dreamer came up with this whole concept of using hydrofoil technology in a propeller and he's like you know how hard could it be uh, well, it turns <laughs> out freaking difficult um uh, but but because we have such a passionate founder, and because he's obviously got some money behind himself, um, he was able to find a really cool designer, uh, Roland Alonso, and he came from a bicycle background. We probably should have actually got an aeronautic engineer rather than a bike designer, because um, it's more of a plane than it is a boat, uh, like a bike. But um, yeah, so he pretty much spent two and a half years just in his garage trying to prototype different stuff, and because there's not really much to go on. And then I joined about three years ago and there was only three staff. Two of them have moved on and um, I've just sort of built the team up. But really, once we got the proof of concept and we got some IP protection around it, it was really putting it in the hands of people that might be passionate about it and actually getting their raw feedback. And that was at the stage when we had a completely manual bike that so had no power assistance or anything. And then we chucked it out in Carapuro and um, we realized that, you know, it was pretty much a couple of minutes that you could ride it for before you were absolutely stuffed because it was just, you know, the physical exertion and the constant resistance on water meant that we couldn't ride it for very long. And so we kind of went back to the drawing board and said, okay, you know, what should we do to extend the ride time? Is it acceptable now? We kind of came to the conclusion that we wanted people to be able to ride for at least sort of 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, and so we looked at pontoons and we looked at all that stuff, but that was that was like not at all in keeping with what Guy wanted the experience to be. And then so I think pretty naively we thought, well, why don't we just make it an e-bike? Um, <laughs> well, it turns out it's ridiculously hard to make an e-bike that can go in salt water. Because um, mm. lithium ion in salt water equals like an explosion. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, so we've hired a whole bunch of electronic engineers and um, we've gone around the world to try and find a waterproof um, motor. And then we've cu- literally custom made this battery pack. It's pretty cool. Like, it's literally from the ground up, waterproof housing, waterproof connector, um, some really cool technology to make sure that it doesn't heat up because we've got heaps of current that we're trying to draw. Um, and then, yeah, we've, we've nailed it in terms of a prototype. Um, and right up until that point, pretty much five and a half years, we were just a private R&D company. No real commercialization uh, expectations or uh, um, pressure from customers or anything like that. And then we naively decided to enter into design awards because we thought it'd be cool to get some publicity. And we won like the, uh, as the best awards in Auckland. So we ended up winning gold in the, pro- uh, the product concept category. And then it just exploded and New Zealand media got caught up on Facebook and we got like 250 million views on one video, literally on all of the um, biggest Facebook pages in the world, like Uni, um, Unilad, Design Boom, all that. We got on the homepage of redbull.com where it was like listed as Forbes top 12 super yacht toys and literally still had a prototype. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, all the marketing team thought that was awesome, but all of our engineers just started panicking because like now we had like a million people hit our website and damn near crash it. And then we had like 30,000 people on our database that wanted one, including all these really high profile people. Um, so then it was like kind of like, you know, really trying to grow the team to be able to actually get this bike into market, which has been super complex to do. But no, we're going really well. It's um, We're now at a point where we're pushing into production and then we're trying to deliver it for April uh, for New Zealand customers. And then we've just opened pre-sales in the US, the UK and Europe. Uh, and that's going really well. We've only been live for a uh, week and a half and we've landed quite a bit of pre-sales, so it's pretty cool. Fantastic. And you guys must sit somewhere between the Aura Ring and Tesla cars. <laughs> is uh, <laughs> having a gigantic demand for an awesome product that um, was, like you said, just a prototype. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, and, and um, a lot of people just sort of think it's a bike. And most bike companies, they design a frame. And then they just go to one of the, the bike shows and pick, pick the wheels, pick the brakes, pick the um, handlebars and everything in it, and you've got a bike. But for us, everything is custom. The only thing that really makes it a bike is the seat and the handlebars and the pedals. Everything else is our own parts. And when you go to a, a um, company to make it, they've never seen anything like it before. So it's yeah. just super complex to go through that whole design for manufacture. Um, but no, it's pretty cool. Like I, I didn't even come from a product background. So I'm leading this team and really had no idea about you know product commercialization. And so I've just been trying to learn as much as I can from our engineers, um, and we were lucky to have some really senior and really qualified guys um, to help me. So, and some awesome suppliers from all over the world. So, it's been a pretty cool journey. Brilliant. Um, so, guy, guy started his, his chat off with. Um, he said he's a dreamer, and he, he was, you know, quite a Walt Disney dream. If you can dream it, you can do it. What's it been like having that sort of mentorship, man? Um, it's been amazing like the thing with guy is that he's, he doesn't dabble in detail he literally he's 10 years ahead of us right so he he sees this as an olympic sport um yeah. and and like a global water sports company and we still haven't got a product so it's it, it's an absolute necessity to have someone like him with deep pockets and a wicked dream to be able to inspire us and to be able to back us because no one else would have would have funded this um up until now and so that's been awesome to work with them. And every time I come in, I mean, we'll have like a prototype that's cost us literally hundreds of thousands to get ready, chuck it in the water and it doesn't work at all. And it's literally like, man, if that was my money, I'd be like, I'd be so gutted. So I go to him and I say, oh, you know, guy, it's, you know, this has happened or that's happened. And straight away, he's like, okay, what are we going to do about it? He's straight away just like, he's not, he's never, he's always like the super optimist and he's mm -hmm. always about like wanting, wanting to know the solution. He doesn't want to dabble in the, and the problem right so that that's been a real cool learning curve for me and yeah it's just kind of gone through his whole life with that attitude and so that's been a, a huge learning curve but on the flip side of that and also makes it really challenging because he doesn't dabble in the detail and because he is such a dreamer i'm sitting there in engineering meetings and i know what's physically possible and what we're trying to achieve is a world first on so many fronts and it's been, there's been inevitable delays and we need way more staff than we think we do and our staff are redlining and all this stuff. So it's been like a really interesting dynamic to listen to what Guy says, filter it and pretty much only tell our team like 10% of what he's told me. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so it, yeah, it's been a real interesting one. But the other thing which has been really cool is over the last year, because it's been such a really cool product and so innovative, we've been able to pull on some really talented mentors. Mm -hmm. So I've built an, advi an advisory team around me that's been really helpful that they come from like, you know, we've got an expert in global marketing. We've got an expert in the US. I mean, he sits on the New Zealand US Council. Um, we've got a guy who's epic in product who um, his dad owned the biggest, one of the biggest water sports companies in the world. Um, and then we've got one of the P PwC partners um, all, all, all around me. And that's been super helpful just to try and get their take on it as well and also help Guy to be able to take his ideas and ground them in something we can achieve. Um, so, yeah. It's been, no, it's, 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 been uh, cool. it's full on and it's pretty pretty interesting <laughs> that a year back, 
when you're, or I suppose I'll just have a year back when you were asked to talk about resilience and, and failures and, and all that sort of stuff. You had, you thought you didn't really have much idea around it. Well, you've been able to put into practice what you spoke about last year. Um, one of your, one of your key, take, key takeaways was reframing it. Um, and, you know, just off the top of my head, when I got to ride the bike, the manual bike, and like you said, you you were, you know, it was hard enough to get the thing going, let alone maintain riding on it. And like you see, you were cooked. It must have been quite a um, bittersweet moment when you guys put it in the water, you took off, and you're like, oh, so we're flying. And then, oh, no, now it's dead again. <laughs> how, how, it. how important was it to quickly reframe and, and, and carry on? And I think the other thing you said about it is um, connect with the purpose and, and passion. <laughs> um. Yeah, man. It, to be honest, like it's super challenging. There's days where you just think, "What are we even doing here?" Like, you know, you put a prototype in the water and it just doesn't work, or like, you know, something gets broken, massive delays. Um, you know, what we thought was going to work it just ha- is not going to work at all, and we're back to the drawing board. And that's super, super challenging some days. But then, and 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 the engineers get really, really upset about it as well because they're they're ultimately trying as hard as they can, and it's not any fault of their own um it's just just the 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 type of product that we're trying to develop so i mean i've taken a lot from guy as i said about the whole okay what are we going to do and spending time on the solution um but yeah it's been super challenging for me as well because you know um i'm a young ceo and i like i don't i some days i'm thinking like man i'm super unqualified to do this Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) like incredibly unqualified so yeah, when, when, when disasters like that happen, I'm just like, sheesh, you know, like what do I do now and how do I motivate um, my engineers who are literally twice my age um, to keep going and pushing? Um, but I guess when you, when you do fail as many times as we fail, and literally that's on like a daily basis, <laughs> you kind of, you do build up quite a bit of a resistance to that and you kind of get strategies for how you can motivate the team again. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I said, you know, um, in that speech I was talking about framing it before you even go in. Mm. So it's literally just saying, hey, we're going to prototype this to see if this works. And once you framed it like that, then the team go and smash it. They prototype it as fast as they can and we put it in. We're not saying that that was ever going to be perfect. We're saying we're validating it. And when it doesn't work, sweet, it didn't work. What are we going to do now? What, what's the next validation step? So I think a big thing is not like putting all like in your head, putting everything into it, like saying that, I mean, you, you physically try and push as hard as you can, but you know that that's actually just a validation thing. It's not actually the only option. You know, it's just the first thing you're going to do. And if nice. you can frame it, then you can kind of, yeah, you, you become way more resilient, I think. Yeah. Um, one one question I have for you is that, as you spoke about in that, in that Seed Boycato talk, you sort of went through the startup factory. Um, you, yeah. got, you got to to basically um, a stage where you'd, you'd pivoted away a product and you thought you were ready to go, but the money ran out and then you got taken over to Mender 5. How is it when, you know, that's your experience of startup and entrepreneurship, um, how is it working with something like so big as Mender 5 to, I guess, not fall back on the fact that oh, what I've done so far hasn't quite worked out and what I'm doing now, we're there, but we're not there. Is this just going to be what, what happened before? How do, how do you keep going out of that? I guess it's my question. I don't know if I've worded that properly. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Because you, you do get a bit of, um, when you get those setbacks, you do kind of start to question things. Um, and you, you can get to a point where you're kind of focusing on what you haven't achieved yet. Um, I, I guess it's just getting really, uh, it's, it's really having the time to reflect. That's one thing is like, um, you know, because I now have about 16 staff, 17 as of next week, 18 as of January, it's, um, I, I'm always just constantly going from meeting to meeting to meeting. Mm. Um, but when I actually um, take the time and physically book out of my calendar, um, that really allows me to, to deeply reflect on what we have actually done really well. And I've just made it my job, literally, to be the, be the positive person, be the person in the team that... Um, if they, if we, the team doesn't have a solution, I'm sitting there asking the questions positively to try and make them think creatively again. Um, and I just try and wear that hat. Like I literally physically think, okay, I'm feeling negative today. Like I need to put on that creative, like, you know, leadership hat um, and go on with that. 
Um, but in terms of, I think the fact that I have failed a lot of business ideas technically and and um, like fundamentally failed them, I think it allowed me to also stay pretty humble because right now everyone's like, whoa, you guys are so successful. You like, you guys are smashing out on so many fronts. You've just got listed on Forbes, um, Red Bull, all that. That doesn't mean we've got a successful business. We literally have a little bit of money trickling in and we're bleeding out money like you wouldn't believe. Our cash burn is crazy. So we're not there yet. And so it's like by having those failures, you don't rest on your laurels. Like I'm not sitting here thinking it's all, it's all roses either, which I think is super important. Um, yeah, so we're just gunning hard as to validate um, through this next year and capital raise um, to be able to do that. So I don't know. It's it's an interesting one, man. It's always a um, yeah. It's been it's been an interesting dynamic to try and get that balance right. No, awesome, man. And I think that's what you talked was really awesome as, as well. It was you were really genuine and, and actually what this you know entrepreneurial or startup lifestyle is about. And you know you see plenty of people out there glorifying it. And you look look at it. And go, How, how's that? You know, so amazing. You know, it must it must be tough and. And it was cool that you really gave some implementable steps to, to maintain and keep going and, and follow the passion. Um, you, you said about putting, putting the hat on and, and um, in, your, in your speech, you, you spoke about the opposite of, of uh, well, well, failure was grief. And the, and the, and the thing yeah. that you sort of wanted, you know, obviously losing was hugely difficult and, and tough and, one of the ways that you um, got a, got sort of through the initial period was was again putting on a hat that I'm going to be there for my family. I'm going to speak to the media. I'm going to yep. speak to the funeral. You know, it, it's you know I can't even imagine what it was like. And we you know, last last week or the week before, Jordan Peterson was on on Joe Rogan, and there was one of the exact mm. things he talked about was being the most reliable person at, at a funeral, and, and you know it's, it's devastating. Is that the same thing in business that you can be the most reliable person and get through it? Or like you said in the speech, you know, grief is completely opposite to, to a little bit of a failure. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, obviously the emotional side of, of um, losing my sister made it drastically different because I was kind of um, trying to deal with a lot of my own grief at the same time as trying to help my family and trying to, manage a whole bunch of stuff so it was super it was the most challenging task i've ever done um the, the whole media management and dealing with the police and all that stuff um but yeah i guess i guess i do back myself to be that person for our team um they're so at the cold face that when i come in a lot of the time we'll have six engineers in the meeting and they they have absolutely no idea about where to go next. They're just completely perplexed with this idea. And so I always, um, well, firstly, I try and lighten the mood. I mm -hmm. mean, I, the, like I always say to our electronic engineers, I mean, come on, it's a battery. How hard can it be? You know, just stuff like that. And they look over at me just like, e give me the evil's heart out. Because I'm like, come on, Shane, like, you know, it, it can't be that challenging. Um, but I, I just ask questions. I'm not. I'm, I'm never the person who like goes past the point of saying, "Hey." Um, well, I try not to be the person that goes past the point of saying, "I've got the best idea." I don't ever claim to have the solutions. I always just try and allow them to think differently. So I always just say, "Hey, you know, what what are we really trying to solve for here? What have you guys tried to explore? Um, what do you think we could do in terms of is there other experts that could help us?" Um, just asking questions. That, and it's amazing how that they actually have the solutions in their head. It's just actually getting them to talk. And one person will say something and then the other person will be like, no, nah, that's not going to work. But if we did that and that, that might work, you know? And then, so yeah, that's what I back myself to be is that person that wears that hat um, and just tries to solve other people's problems through asking questions. Um, that's what I do pretty much all day, <laughs> every day pretty much. Well, I see. And um, elasticity was one of the, the terms that you talked about, like bouncing back and, yeah, um, obviously that's where you're at. You're the person to rebound the the uh, failure or the idea off. Um, is, do, do you feel the burden of responsibility, or, or is, is it a two way street? Yeah, everybody's you know um, resonating with each other, and, and it works out well. Um, no, that's that's been a huge learning curve for me this year. I, I feel incredibly responsible for 
um, the vision to deliver on the vision of Guy. And that's why I'm still here is really because I want to deliver that. I feel incredibly responsible for the amount of money that we're spending. Like we spend an incredible amount and it's frightening to look at. Um, I feel really responsible for the um, the lack of clarity around some of the stuff we're doing within our teams because we are changing so quickly. And I can see that our team sometimes, it's the over, it's really overwhelming for them to not have real clarity. So I feel really responsible for that as well. Um, but I'm also really reflecting on this year and like I don't think I've been very helpful to myself to be that person so I've, I've been like really they haven't been eating that well I like, haven't been spending time for myself haven't been um, doing much exercise or fitness um, you know I haven't been reading a lot I haven't been um, I mean I've been talking to a lot of people and listening to a few podcasts here and there but I think I need to really that my next year is really about setting myself up as the person that I need to be for myself and mm. really be that active, fit, healthy person so that I can really up my game and create more clarity in my own head to be able to then create the clarity for my team. Um, and yeah, when you are fit and healthy, um, stress, the stress hormones, you can actually see, you can actually transfer them and say, okay, I'm feeling this way. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a negative stress thing. It's actually just, it's fueling me for the, the thing that I'm in right now. So I'm feeling stressed about this meeting. It's because I want to do well in this meeting. It's because I want to help my team. It's because I want, you know, it's like reframing it. So yeah, that's that's my main takeaway from this year is really now it's about myself. I need to gear up. I need to spend my weekends wisely, not get dressed up and go um, go partying. <laughs> um, but actually, you know, like go and do some stuff for myself. Well, yeah. Look at, um, that's interesting what you just said there. I saw Bud and Barrett, it must have been in an airport or something. The other day he had a Q&A and somebody asked him, well, do you get nervous? And he said, yeah. He said, but, you know, that's a privilege for me to get nervous. It's, it's a privilege for me to be in a position where, you know, I guess you could feel the weight of a nation on, on, on your shoulders or you could say, hey, I get to, I'm the person that gets to do this. And, and yeah, exactly right. You know, you can get stressed out about a meeting, but maybe being in that meeting was exactly what you wanted. And, and you know, it's... Yeah. It's time, time to deliver. Um, you... there's, a, there's, this, there's this TED talk that I just watched the other day, and she was um, she's a psychologist who studied stress. And um, right up until uh, a few years ago, she said that stress is the worst thing you can possibly do. It, um, you know, cardiovascular diseases and like strokes and um, heart attacks and all this stuff. There was like you know strong evidence to suggest that stress was directly linked to those things, and it is. But then she was she went and did some really deep research and there was this new new research that was done and basically they went and looked at people who weren't stressed at all or reported that they didn't feel much stress in their life they went and looked at people that um, were really stressed and and saw that as a negative thing but then they also looked at people who felt that they had a high level of the stress type symptoms but saw that as a good thing in their life and they actually worked out that these people that saw stress but actually thought it was a good thing for them, that it was gearing them up for what they needed to do, they were actually more healthy than the other two groups, which is fascinating. She said, like, you know, like, these stress hormones that we have, they're your body reacting and preparing yourself. It's like the fight-flight reaction, right? Mm -hmm. If the dog's running at you, you're going to get this massive hit of adrenaline. That's not a bad thing. It's, you you got to jump that fence and get away, you know, like, and it's the same thing for me now. I look at stress. I'm, you know, like people are panicking in my office. Yeah, it's going to stress me out, but it's it's gearing me up to be able to actually sort what sort sort out what's going on. So I guess that that's been a real good sort of like reflection point for me. Nice uh, putting into practice that reframing, mate. You've you've uh, been super lucky to to bring on board a, a bunch of people from from the very course that you did at, at Waikato Uni. Um, <laughs> what what's it like having a, a team of young people who are enthusiastic? Um, one, what does that give you? And two, how do you maintain that enthusiasm? Um, yeah, it's been really cool. Eh? I was just trying to count in my head how many we've got here. Um, we've probably got like six or seven um, at least. No, maybe eight, nine maybe. People that are all from you know university that might have been straight out of uni or only done one other job. And that comes with, um, complexities but it also comes with like a whole new way of thinking which is really really cool um, they're all super talented they've all got theory and they know how to implement it's just really guiding them a little bit 
um, and putting in the right management structures, which we haven't really done a great job of. We're kind of improving that space. Um, but in terms of the ideas that come out, I mean, you, you got like um, people that know the future of technology. We're, we're really, really capable in terms of our digital marketing ability because we don't have people that are sitting there who have done print media for 20 years. You know what I mean? Like it's like they are really up to play with that stuff and they're really keen to push the envelope, which is um, really in keeping with our product as well. You know, Blair and head of content, he's coming out with all these wicked ass um, videos because he's done weddings and he's done all this stuff, but he's also come from a business background and he's like super fresh and keen. Um, and then we've got girls in our marketing team that are like really, really keen to try and like use a lot of the new technology in terms of HubSpot and retargeting on social media and tracking and all this stuff. So um, I think we're doing a really good job with the hiring of those people. And then we've got Samaria and Bryn in our supply chain team and they're like, they're completely innovating. They, they, they don't have any preconceived ideas about what supply chain looks like. And so they're saying to us, okay, well, who are we doing? Who are we doing this for? Who's our customer? And what, what would be the most ideal experience for them in terms of how the bike gets delivered, knowing what it's going to be, when it's going to get delivered, the whole unboxing experience. How can we completely yeah. redesign the unboxing experience? How can we create a community online where people can learn to ride, learn to put it together, service it? Um, you know, is there mobile service providers that can come out and fix your bike rather than the traditional, you know, service model that's pretty crap and pretty archaic? So having young people that haven't had experience in doing the traditional means that they can think totally differently, which is awesome. But it does come with complexity because they are young and they are green and they do need uh, a lot more support and um, and also that you need to check in with them often because sometimes yeah. they can, because they're so faith, so close to it, they can sometimes lose the bigger picture of the, the whole commercial realities of the whole company. Mm. Um, yeah, because you can't just spend heaps of money on one thing um, or one one thing that they're doing isn't actually a number one priority for our company. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've just been trying to trying to get them all um, to see a bit bit of the bigger picture. So. And also putting some mentorship around them as well. So we've got a super young team in the marketing, for instance, and now I've got on board Kevin Malloy, who's literally one of the best marketing strategy guys in the country. He was the global media manager for Coca-Cola. Wow. Um, now on the board of TVNZ and Kiwi Bank and a senior advisor to Tourism New Zealand. And so you've got literally these five uh, marketing team and like this absolute baller who's just super passionate about young people. And he's like, just validating that their ideas are epic. He's like, yep, double down on that. That's epic. What you just said there is brilliant. Like just really giving them the, um, the feedback and also the, the, the um, validation that their ideas are actually legit. And so those sort of things I think are, um, are really important for the team. Like, and we've got Lou, who's a new marketing guy, uh, sorry, a new finance guy. And we've got um, him linked up with um, the PwC partner in Auckland, you know, it's just really trying to like link young people with, with experienced people that can mentor them. Fantastic. So what's, what's the ethos of, of Mandify as a company in that they um, apply such trust to, to a young and up and coming um, graduates, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, I, honestly, uh, I, I often question um, why I mean, why guys even put me in this role? <laughs> like, yeah. like he could he could go and find like an absolute baller CEO who's done it all and like you know is taking companies global and all that. But it, I don't know. He just he just really backs and really enjoys being around young people with creative ideas. And I think um, I've built a really strong relationship with Guy. I kind of see him almost like as an uncle figure. You know, he's like wow. um, so. Yeah, I've just built a lot of trust with him and um, I always tell him the truth. Like I always try and be really honest with him about where I'm at and what I need to learn. And I guess that's just, um, yeah. And I, I, maybe maybe it's also because when he started Torpedo 7 with his son, Luke, Luke was really one of the main drivers of it. And he was only 22 at the time. Mm. And he, he built that to like a 100, 100 million revenue company in, in 12 years. So it's like, Young people can do it. They just they just need different stuff to be able to to nail it. Mm. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's it. But in terms of my team, I because I back them and because I know what they're good at. Um, I just share with Guy all the stuff we're doing. And I mean, how can you argue with some of the successes that these guys are having? You know, within the marketing and getting viral videos and get, uh, getting Guy onto all these different um, media channels and stuff. He's just loving it. Yeah. yeah so. 
Cool. And, and has that sort of uh, driven his passion to, to you know, dive deeper into this this marketing and, and this sort of online world? You know, he is into a TED talk and all that sort of stuff. Is, <laughs> is, is he feeling a little bit like a, a kid himself? Is it keeping him young, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> to, to be honest, man, I honestly believe that's the main reason why he backed this company. It wasn't uh, in the early days. It, uh, I mean, he saw it as being quite a cool product, but he had absolutely no idea how many people would want one. It was literally just so he could be a big kid again and he could come in and like look at all these epic designs and like, you know, geek out over the new foils and like, you know, what we could do with the battery technology. And I mean, it's funny because I say to guy, you know, oh, we've like early in the last year, we had um, some issues around trying to find a, a motor. And guys are like, okay, sweet. Yeah, and he left the meeting. And next minute, he's sitting there like Googling and finding all these different motors. And he was at the um, the bike show. He actually found our motor for us that we currently use now just nice. by going and having yarns with all these people. So he just he just loves being part of that design process. Yeah. Um, I'm trying really, really hard now to, to get that balance right. So Because I'm like, guy, I want you to think about governance and risk and raising capital and all those things. But I want you to be keeping thinking about how we can redesign the foils. You know? <laughs> But no, he loves it. He loves it, though. No, so, and one of our early guests, uh, Dan Thompson, who he owns and runs CircuBand, and one of their key pieces of technology is being able to measure the output of, you know, a, a, a basically a stretch band. And they've been able to collaborate with, I think, Innovation New Zealand. As a, as a company that's really innovating, how important is it collaborating with people with random ideas and random pieces of technology that you guys can implement? Yep, yep, definitely, man. That's a big, I'm a big advocate for collaboration with heaps of different people. So we have Callahan Innovation, who's yeah, really helped us. And any, yeah. It, yeah, anyone who um, is doing deep R&D in anything, whether it be like technology or online or anything, you can get funding from Callahan. So there's some really, really passionate people in Callahan that's really good. And they've actually just simplified the whole R&D grant process to make it way easier. So that's cool. Um, NZTE, so once you've actually got a product and you're trying to launch overseas, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise can help you with research into new markets and stuff, and they can connect you with a whole bunch of different people. Um, and then, yeah, it's really just, um, I always love going and talking to anybody who's who's done business before. Who's I mean, we've, we've talked to Gallagher about their product international. We've talked to like um, Blowcart. We've talked to um, Alan Gibbs with his um, amphibious vehicles. We've just talked, I mean, we, I went and I've had five meetings now with Peter Beck from Rocket Lab, but right. he is just mind, he is mind blowing, eh? Like he's <laughs> raised hundreds of millions of dollars in, in Silicon Valley. He's just that dream child from New Zealand who's just firing rockets into space. I mean, ha having meetings with people like that, man, it's just, it's so epic. Um, so yeah, I just try and get in uh, meetings with everyone like that, uh, and just try and glean glean as much as you can from these people. But I've I've learned a couple of things about it. Eh? Like, first off, is like if, almost every person that I ask, um, you know, if I could get some advice from them or any, anything, all of them say yes. I've very rarely had a no. It might be that hey, I'm a bit busy at the moment, but and so that's the first thing I just always reach out, and they always say, always tend to say yes. But then um, the main thing about trying to get the best advice out of them is making sure they have context. Yeah. So th when you go and meet with them, if they're just sitting there yarning at you, like, oh, you should do this, you should do that, you should do this, very often they haven't really sat and understood what you're, what you're actually wanting from them. So if they ask really good questions and they're sitting there and listening for most of the meeting and then they give you those bits of advice at the end, that's typically, that means that they've got context and it means that their ideas are probably way more on point. Um, so I always try and make sure that the mentors and the advisors we have around us do have good context. Um, and then the other thing I'd say is like, you know your product or your service better than anybody. So mm. if someone, even if they're absolute baller, they say something and you're just like, yeah, that kind of doesn't really relate. Or they say one thing, but two other people say a different thing. Um, and you have a gut feel that this is these two other people are more right than this person then trust your gut and take take what you want from them, but also feel free to let go of the stuff you don't believe fits with your business or your service. Yeah, that's no, kind that, of what I've learned. That's awesome feedback, mate. And I'd reiterate that <clears throat> people are very good at saying yes. As, you know, this podcast is, is just, you know, proof of that. You know, there's the odd, odd person that you can't actually get hold of, but if you get yeah. hold, hold of somebody, then 
that more often than not they'll they'll find a way to to connect and i guess that's really deep down what human nature is it's, it's about helping others and and that's what you said at the start that you've you know not isolated yourself to to this year you're, you're really keen on on helping others and and helping to share what you've learned and, and and it was really valuable with seed what do, what are you sort of you know to, to flip it around what are you getting out of it yeah i don't know i think i think everyone enjoys giving back yeah i'm i'm there um sorry about that um no so um what do i get out of it i, th I think if it's for the right person who I believe is they're going to take, the, they know why they're calling me, they know what I'm good at, or they, they think they know what I'm good at. Um, <laughs> they, 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 know, they know what they're going to ask me, and they're not going to waste my time. Um, I get a real kick out of sitting down with someone who's super passionate about, I, I get passionate about anybody's idea, right? Um, and so, yeah, I just get a thrill out of helping others. And it's the same for most people that I talk to as well. Um, but then I think what can diminish that very very quickly is if i give somebody advice um and they just they don't follow up with me or mm. they don't go and do what i've said and they and they want to meet up again i'm not i'm not a hype king i'm not going to sit there and just like you know be your personal coach and like try and help you to um you know to to, to, to go and do the same stuff that we've talked about last meeting um but anybody who goes away and does um some of the stuff that i've talked about or, ha or does something different that I didn't say, but still validate something. And they come back and they said, man, I went away and I did this, this and this. And then now I'm thinking about this. What do you think? I'm more than happy to double down with them. Um, so that's what I've, I've sort of kind of taken my own personal um, reflections on how I've helped others and tried to flip that around for me. So for me, I always, okay, I want to go and meet this person. So Peter Beck, for instance, he's an absolute baller at raising capital in, the, in Silicon Valley. He's um, a real world dreamer, like he, he, he's, he's a big thinker. And I wanted to, to try and understand how he could raise money with a very, very technical product and keep raising money off the same investors. So I knew why I wanted to talk to him. I found his number, I rang him up and I was very direct as to what I was wanting from him. And then he said, sweet, I'm on a plane. I can't talk to you right now. Send me an email. So I sent him an email, got a meeting. He gave me a, a few nuggets of gold. I, I had a lunch with him. And then I went away and I wrote every single thing down that he said. I gave it to our board. And then I reflected on it. I validated some of the key things he said. I went and told a lot of my staff about some of the things he said. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to him and said, thanks very much. This is what I've learned. This is what I'm going to do. And then I did. I followed up, came back to him and said, we've done these things. Would you be keen to catch up again? Because I want to talk to you about the next thing. And he was keen as. And then I went and talked to him and then, and now he's like super interested. Now he's coming down to, to meet us, our whole team in Manta 5 from Auckland. He's coming down to Hamilton next January, you know, because it's just, it's, it's giving people that, um, it's showing them that the value that they've offered, you've run with it. It's the same with Kevin Malloy. I mean, we literally couldn't afford to pay this guy. He's, he's, he's so expensive because he's so good. Um, but he does it all for free because he just loves helping young people. So he's had two half-day workshops with our marketing team. He's um, on our advisory board and has a meeting every two months now. It's just like, he, and he said his wife is going to kill him when he, when, she, when he tells her that he's got another thing that he's doing. Um, but he's just so passionate, you know, like, so it's just tapping into that, I guess. So that's, yeah. that's an absolute gem of advice there, mate. Um, it's really, really cool. What do, you, what do you think's special about just being um, in the humble of Waikato? <laughs> not much not much <laughs> <laughs> I, nah. I, must, I must allow you guys to just do do your thing and, and carry on and, and uh, don't have to worry about you know although I know you guys are well known but yeah but, you know for five years you've been able to we're able to go under the radar you know has that been valuable do you think <laughs> um yeah yeah I think it has been a little bit valuable I think the key thing is that it's um the Hamilton community is getting better and better. I think, and we're a lot closer and I think um, there's a lot less competition and more collaboration around here. So um, Soda and all those guys, they're just open door policy. You can go and talk to any of them. Like um, a lot of super connected people in Hamilton, uh, the investors that you can just go and meet with because they, they, it's a really small community. Um, on the flip side, it is pretty challenging to try and hire really specialized talent here. 
Yep. Um, there's, only, there's only a few companies like it. So we've got people from Auckland, from Christchurch, from, um, you know, from all over to come and work here. And when you say, hey, do you want to move from Queenstown to Hamilton? Um, <laughs> it's a pretty big ask. Um, so we found that pretty challenging. Um, but, oh, man, honestly, the CBD in town and stuff is, like, getting pretty cool. Like, they've yeah. got a whole bunch of co-working spaces now. Like, what Seed is doing is just amazing. Um, what Matt Stark is doing with some of the property in town, it's it's getting pretty epic. Um, but, yeah, man, I didn't want to stay in Hamilton. Um, the only reason I'm here is because I keep getting offered uh, opportunities that I can't leave. But yeah. um, it's cool. It is a cool It is a cool vibe here. Awesome, man. And I think the uh, Golden Triangle is definitely helping a lot, you know. The um, yep. the distance from Auckland in in Tauranga, despite being exactly the same, is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And hey, soon you might be able to jump on a bullet train. <laughs> yeah, I wish. I wish. Be, it, it was, that was one thing when we were in Taipei um, or in Taiwan for for the um, for suppliers. You can go from Taipei to Tainan, which is like you know um, north to south, and you're going on 280k an hour. And you can go from there to there. It's like pretty much Auckland to Buddy Talpo. And you wow. can do that in like an hour and a bit. And you could be in a meeting. If we had that running from Hamilton to Auckland, you'd literally be in Auckland in 20 minutes, jump on the subway, and you'd be at your meeting way faster than you could. I mean, if we had the money to make a bullet train, it'd be epic. Uh, it's, um, and even even commuter life in Hamilton, I, I think in the last year, I was like, God, why, why is there just four hubs, bang, you're in the CBD? You know, there's a trade there. That's it. But, it's just one of, those, one of those things, like you say, the um, the money and the prioritisation uh, is, is tough, especially for uh, a rural country like New Zealand that's used to jumping in your car and, and being there. <laughs> that's it, mate. Um, back to back to one more sort of perceived failure that you, that you you spoke about in your seed chat is that not not getting into union, and you said that you were often um, often making sure that you didn't do things that you might fail at. What what was your sort of, um, and I've asked this of somebody else, what was the thing that flicked the switch that, hey, I'm in uni now, I'm going to give it 100% and then you came out the other end, you know. You, you're the guy that people often talk about from from that business degree is, is doing really well and, and, and am I correct that you sort of spoke at, at the graduation as well? Like, what was your, your um, what was yeah. the moment that made you go, hey, I'm going to do this really hard and, and not be scared of what might happen and, you know, um, I don't know, man. Like I left high school and I did really poorly at high school. Um, I, I wasn't very good at reading and um, I, yeah, I didn't really listen a lot. Um, <laughs> and so when I left, when I left, when I left school, I kind of had this whole perception that I wasn't actually that good at education. And I just went and you know did some catering. I got my truck license and was a truck driver for a while. And I was sitting in the truck and I was like, man, I want to start a business and I really want to. You know, I really want to have, I, I feel entrepreneurial and I want to give it a go. And then, so I was kind of sitting there and I was like, well, you know, what if, what if I just went to university? And I was kind of thinking of this whole what if situation. So I just started going like, what if I went to uni? What if I just doubled down and just tried as hard as I could? You know, what if I networked with as many people as I could and to try and help me get through? Because I knew that I wasn't going to be book smart. Um, and then, yeah, just thought yeah well this is better than getting truck driving um <laughs> so i'll give it a go and then i got to uni and i just kept thinking like what ifs about stuff so i was really really um poor at public speaking it was yep. like I, I get panic attacks hard out and so then i was like sweet well how am i going to solve for that so um there was a, a non-profit at uni um and i just saw them come in and I was, and I kind of thought, yeah, no, that's pretty cool. So I went and had a look there, and they had this thing where you basically did community projects, and then at once a year you went to a national competition where you presented the projects you'd done for your community. And so I was like, that'd be cool if I was one of those presenters. Um, and so uh, yeah, I applied for it, and I was packing myself like it was only like a two or three minute speech to five people, but I was like, <laughs> you know, this would, a, this would be a really good thing. And so, yeah, did that. And then um, I, I did the whole what if. I told them my journey, what if. And I said, you know, I, I, I said to myself, what if I did this? Uh, what if I gave it everything? And I said, if you select me, I, I, I'll, I'll put in everything I have to be the best speaker I can. And they just, they backed me to do that. And then I just got a whole bunch of support around it and kind of just went from there. And see, uh, sorry, um, the nonprofit I was with, with Anactus, I ended up going from being like a junior member to 
um, being the leader of, of Enactus, and I took them to three World Cups, which was in um, California and then uh, Malaysia and then back to Washington, D.C. And I just got to see, like, student things. I mean, I'm, I also got to go to Cambodia and then to India all through uni, and it was just literally by thinking what if and like seeing opportunities and even if they didn't look that attractive I was like I'm going to try and find out mm. and so it's just I don't know it just taught me a lot about that whole like seeking it out and giving it a go wicked it's a it's a really good really good uh mindset what if because what if you know and it goes I guess it goes back to guy you know if you can if you can dream it you can do it it's that's it <laughs> there's a synergy mate you, you said that this next year is going to be about becoming you know the person that you want to be so that you can then pass that on to other people what what sort of things have you thought about that you might do to 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 implement that yep no good question man i've been thinking a lot about that um the first thing is is just my i'm really inconsistent so like you know i'll start something you know i'll go to the gym once and then get sore and not go back or whatever and (laughs) So I'm I'm really trying to focus on being my own best friend. So, mm. um, you know, being being really like structuring my week so that I know that I can achieve it. So if I don't do well in the mornings going to the gym, then setting myself up to go to the gym in the afternoon and maybe doing breathing in the morning or something. So I'm really trying to frame that out. And then it's just, um, yeah, just taking little steps. So I've got a Luke, um, Luke Taylor, yeah. who's my PT now. Um, yeah. and he's like, he's hounding me um, to come in and meet <laughs> Um, yeah, so he's been great. Um, only really just getting started, but um, then just looking at the um, what I'm eating. So I was like ho- looking at the whole keto um, stuff and just trying to work out if that was going to be something for me. So um, and then just going and doing pa- stuff I'm passionate about. Like I'm, I'm getting a new downhill mountain bike to go and smash up some hills, and um, got a road bike to do some of that. And um, yeah, so that's that's on the health side of stuff. And then really, I'm just. I'm also thinking about my mental health as well. Just I get a lot, I get pretty worked up about things at work and really try and, you know, I, I, I'm sort of stewing over stuff at, at the end of the day. So um, just trying to think of ways that I can kind of charge myself up in the morning and then charge myself down at night, mm. and getting more consistent during my week um, and then not getting to a point where I'm so um, wound up by stuff that I end up like my mates are going out drinking and it's like, sweet, that's like a release. Mm. just trying to also work out that sort of stuff and then also just trying to be way way more authentic as well like i think once you when you feel real like vulnerable as a person then you kind of you can protect yourself with kind of your ego a little bit and um i really want to try and remove a lot of that stuff and really try and understand um you know why i'm feeling the way i am and you know having better human connections with people and um yeah, that's that's kind of my main focuses for the for the new year. So, and I'm 30 as well, so um, I'm thinking of a challenge. Yeah. Um, to do. Um, Thomas Nabs yeah. was um, talking about his marathon. <laughs> I don't think I'll do a mar- I don't think I'll do a marathon, but um, you know, what's a what's a thing that I can ra- aim towards? Yeah. Because um, I used to love sport, eh? Like I used to like play competitive hockey, hardcore, and love rowing and all that, and I've kind of just lost it. Yeah. So I'm just kind of kind of thinking like. You know, what can I do that sort of lights my fire outside of work? Yeah, to just, you know, be careful hanging around Luke. You'll, you'll be doing an Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> he's a beast, eh? Like, that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm real keen to learn from him just about, like, man, he's a, he, he's a weapon across his life, you know? He's, like, super, like, disciplined in his own life and constantly learning and changing his, his whole um, training style and what he's eating and all that. Yeah, um, mm. It's pretty cool to see. No, he's... Um... He's a great person to know, and likewise with, yeah. with Thomas Nabs and, uh, and yourself, mate. Um, I know you've got to uh, head off this afternoon to to a baby shower. So, yeah, <laughs> where, yeah. Where, where can people find you and Mentor Five? Um, yeah, I mean, we've got a pretty cool new website. It's just mentor5.com. Um, so you can find out information about the bike, and there's some videos and stuff. And then, yeah, I'm just on LinkedIn. Um, yep. that's usually the best way um so it's just greg johnston on linkedin um yeah and i'm yeah i'm always keen for people to add add me on linkedin and i'm always keen to follow their journey as well fantastic so, yeah. and i'll and i'll put uh, that in the show notes and a link to 
your fantastic speech at Seed Waikato. I think it was about event two, and you set a high standard. Um, what, would, <laughs> what would you like to leave people with, mate? A, a thought or an ask, even, or, or something that you're living your life by? Um, I don't know, man. Like, I think. I think the most helpful thing to to people is really around that, that validation stuff. Eh? Like um, a lot of people just sit there and they take their idea and they just sell it to themselves over and over and over again to the point where all of their assumptions become facts in their own head. Mm-hmm. And I just think, uh, you know, if you really actually want to achieve whatever it is you want to do, then get out of your own head and go and talk to people and um, get some strategies around doing that. There are people that can help you to make that, make that easy and, and make sure you're not getting false positives um, because it ultimately what, what it ends up doing is creating a way way better product or service and people will absolutely love it so it's like if that's what you're ultimately wanting to achieve then yeah validate validate that's pretty much my, that's it that's my main takeaway i think that's and then just keep keep buddy i'm what i'm doing and trying to get balance because yeah anything you you get stuck into you can get pretty um yeah, you can get pretty unbalanced pretty quick. So, <laughs> <laughs> Love it, mate. Um, and I'll let you enjoy the rest of your Saturday in the mighty Waikato. Um, thanks so much for coming on. Yep. I'm sure people will get so much out of this chat. I've, I've uh, got tingles now. That's, that was fantastic. <laughs> That's thanks, cool. Well, yeah. Um, is Alex making you lunch in the background? or? No, nah, she's making Billy. Billy, <laughs> Billy oh, food. No. Chop, chop, no. chop, and cook pears. <laughs> 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 no, that's epic. Cool, man. I love what you're doing, eh? And like, um, uh, it's wicked to see that whole journaling and stuff that you're doing as well. Um, so I'm keen to, well, um, I'm going to get one of the books like you and see what I can do in the journaling space as well. So, yeah, it's it's actually, for that. your question's been been quite common. Um, if anybody has been following the Instagram and seen the journal, it was just off Etsy. There's <laughs> there's so it's, much. It's a real nice looking one. Yeah, so much cool stuff on there, and you know. Um, yeah, Etsy. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I think Alex, she okay. okay. got a Santa sack that was personalised off Etsy. <laughs> <laughs> I do have, I do have one, I do have one question on that note. Actually, like, um, I think a lot of people like think that or they know that journaling is really important. Um, but I, I get to the end of the day, I'm just so naked, and then I, I, I kind of don't really um, know where to start with journaling. Have you yeah. got any tips, tips on that? Um. They're not my tips. They're, they're tips yeah. from a book that I often recommend to people and it might be better to listen to. I know Luke, Luke <laughs> tried to read it and he found listening to it was better, um, which was Tool yeah. Titans. And even even Tim Ferriss, Tim Ferriss's information is secondhand as well, but it's something like there's the daily, daily journaling or something like that, which I kind of use. So for a long time, I've just written the date. Solid and Rich McCall's thing of Start Again. Um, nice. I've written down two things. I think I both heard on Tim Ferriss. Um, you should live for about 30,000 days and that there's 86,400 seconds in the day. So that are like things to get started. And yep. then of late, which is what I've been putting on Instagram, I've just found a quote on a random topic every day and write that out. And I think that starts, starts a flow. And then um, from the daily journals thing, it's like, Three things you're grateful for, um, three affirmations, so like things that you um, hope about yourself or believe in yourself about. So I am da 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 da. And then Alex, I don't know where did you get um, future gr- um, gratitude things from? You know, I am something that you, you're grateful for in the future. So I've been. Oh, like, okay. My affirmations, like you say it as if it happened. Yeah, you say it as if you happen. That's. That's that's what I do. Okay. It's manifesting. Okay, it's manifesting. It might be the secret if you if you are yeah. an, an Oprah fan. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so that's that's basically, I I think find it that by writing it down and associating that feeling of those things that you would love for in your life that yeah. May, yeah. maybe maybe it'll come to fruition. So that's what it yeah yeah manifesting, I guess. No. Yeah, That's I'm a massive believer in that because it literally, if you if you, if you do visualize it, you start to actually action stuff that gets you towards it, and you see opportunities that you think, shit, I'm actually that could be quite cool to get towards what I've just visualized. So I'm a massive believer in that. Eh? 
Yeah, so that's right. That goes around to your what if, you know, what if I did it? Yeah. Oh, wicked. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Cool. <laughs> Good to talk. Cheers, buddy.